If you were an 80s child in the UK, then you were probably used to seeing lots of different machines from different manufacturers, all mostly being incompatible with each other. Now, Japan had a very similar issue until Microsoft decided to try and address it and succeeded. It was the early 1980s and the Japanese computer market was flooded with choices. Many of those choices, though incompatible with each other, were based on similar hardware, especially the CPU, which tended to be either a Motorola chip or one of the various licensed Zilog Z80 clones. Nazuhiko Nishi was a vice president at Microsoft, but also a director of the ASCII Corporation. Inspired by the way VHS had unified video standards, he wondered if the same could be done for the home computer market. He approached his superiors at Microsoft and explained his idea. Microsoft and the ASCII Corporation realized that a standardized platform for the home would mean greater overall software revenues. They approached various computer manufacturers and worked out a spec based on the capabilities of existing machines, including the Spectra Video SV328, where a lot of the details came from. They quickly agreed on the Z80 being the CPU, based on the fact that it was cheaper and easier to design the computer around it, and the fact that many of its partners already had a Z80 based computer on the market, eventually they agreed on a standard series of specifications. To be MSX accredited, your computer had to meet the basic requirements. This meant that software written for one manufacturer's machines would run on all machines. These initial specs were released in 1983 and were already on the modest side compared to the rest of the market, especially in the US and Europe. But this was the low barrier of entry. As long as they didn't break compatibility, manufacturers could make machines with more memory or more features if they wanted to. Also, the spec allowed for memory upgrades using a cartridge-based system as well. Thus, the MSX standard was born and it would turn into a massive success. Not only did it allow existing manufacturers to produce machines to a spec that would allow even more software to be available for their users, it also allowed other manufacturers, ones that hadn't gotten into the computer market, to break in, such as Panasonic, Canon, Casio and Yamaha. The MSX was based mostly on off-the-shelf components, and even the non-generic bits were eventually incorporated into a single chip dubbed the MSX Engine, to make designing compatible computers even cheaper and easier. For the home consumer, this meant they still had a lot of choice, different manufacturers, uh, even different amounts of built-in memory, different keyboard types and various other abilities, but they knew that the large body of software would most likely work with that machine. Unlike the old days when they had to buy Fujitsu compatible software or NET compatible software, they could just buy MSX software. Probably. <laughs> the initial spec allowed for machines with as little as 16 kilobytes of memory. And as I mentioned earlier, this was a fairly modest uh, amount of memory for the time. So manufacturers quickly released higher end machines with more memory. And because these manufacturers were quite large names like Sony, software companies tended to target 48K or 64K instead of these lower amounts. For the most part, this was solvable with either internal upgrades or, as we said, the cartridges, but there would always be two classes of machines, this lower tier and this higher tier. Although it was still far better than the Wild West that existed before. Over its time, MSX machines were made by over 20 different manufacturers, resulting in countless different computers. Although initially designed as a Japanese initiative, the success did mean an attempt was made to sell internationally. North America was largely ignored due to the popularity of homegrown machines like the Commodore 64, but there was some success in South America. Equally, whilst there was an attempt to enter the UK market, machines like this, the uh, Toshiba HX10, quite a popular machine because it was quite low priced, the relative strength of the Spectrum, Commodore and Amstrad brands meant that it was fighting an uphill battle. The MSX did find success in other European countries though, with both the Netherlands and Spain being especially strong markets. Unfortunately, because it was fairly close to the Spectrum computer and, as we said, was, was uh, fighting an uphill battle against it, most of the software that tended to be released, especially in the UK, were very cheap and nasty ports from the Spectrum. 
And because of that, many Western owners didn't really see how versatile the MSX standard was, what it could actually do. Uh, Amstrad obviously had a similar thing where they also got, at least initially, very bad ports from the Spectrum uh, when it could do far more. By, I'd say, the MSX had it even worse. Um, like half the time, joysticks didn't work on the MSX, even though the vast majority of the machines come with built-in joystick ports. There were several upgrades to the MSX spec throughout its lifetime, culminating in the release of Turbo R in 1990. This no longer used the Z80 chip and instead used a custom ASCII branded 16-bit processor called the R800. By this time though, the MSX was basically over. It had prospered though for nearly seven years. Now this video is really only covering the original MSX spec, which is what these machines use. There's still the MSX2, MSX2 Plus, and the aforementioned Turbo R spec. They'll get their own videos eventually, mostly when I get actual hardware to do. I don't have any of them yet. Um, they get more pricey as they go up, as they get slightly rarer. Uh, but we will eventually get the hardware to cover them and we will do videos on separate ones. I also, we've got to the end of the video and I, I haven't mentioned the acronym uh, and what it means. So, the MSX acronym. <laughs> the reason we haven't mentioned it up to now is because there's really no definitive answer to what it actually stands for. The own cre its own creator has changed his mind on at least two separate occasions. It's either Microsoft Extended, referencing the built-in basic, or it's Matsushita Sony, referencing the first really two truly big manufacturers to sign on. Uh, it could be uh, m machines with software exchangeability, which is one of the first names that uh, Nishi said uh, it might stand for. Um, but then he kind of, uh, that sounds, that one though, I, I do say, so it sounds a little bit like the kind of acronym you make up what it means afterwards. You come up with MSX and then you make up what it means. So I, I, that one, I, it's not up there with my, my possible options in my head. Uh, and yeah, and the father of, of the MSX Nishi, uh, he says he might have named it after the MX missile, which was really in the news at the time. But again, that's the second time he's, he's changed his mind about what it means, so, so who knows? Uh, as I said, there's no definitive answer, but I mean, you consider the fact that Microsoft were heavily involved in this whole thing, and in the 80s they were, let's say, arrogant. <laughs> I I would fully have expected their name to be in there somewhere. So I think probably the Microsoft Extended possibly the most likely, just literally because it's got Microsoft in the actual title. The MSX was pretty much unchallenged in the Japanese market up until the point when the home console started to rise, such as Nintendo's Famicom. A lot of the bigger games publishers, such as Konami, had uh, kind of started on the MSXs and then shifted across. Like franchises like Metal Gear, for instance, were largely popular on the MSX before they came anywhere near any of the other platforms. Because of this, its legacy in Japan is absolutely known. It's it's uh, it, it's such a a huge bedrock in those countries. Like the Spectrum for us, the MSX standard is a huge deal in Japan, uh, which makes it all more of a shame that in the rest of the world, it's pretty much just a footnote. Uh, even in the European countries where it did so well, it's still not kind of part of the legacy as such, apart maybe from the Netherlands where it is, it was vastly more popular. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a shame that it's such a, an amazing range of computers just didn't make it here. You've got the Japanese auctions and there, there are just huge varieties of machines. In fact, of course, we've got three of them right here. <laughs> and we will be talking about these right now. So yeah. Yeah, so these are all MSX machines. These will all run effectively the same software, more or less. This here cartridge in this machine, it's quite stiff. That's a Mega Mapper cartridge. So that, that gives not only uh, the ability to load games from, from an SD card, but also uh, 512K of memory. We can just get that back in, there we go. <laughs> and that same cartridge will work on this Japanese machine here, this rather lovely Hitachi. Uh, HP 50. Uh, it will work on this uh, Japanese Sony uh, HP 10. It will also work on this very much UK plugged up Toshiba HX10. And that's kind of that's the point. These are very different machines. They're different in uh, style, certainly. They're different in the amounts of memory. This machine here just has 16K of memory, whereas these two both have 64. And um, just 
in also their abilities. Like that, this has got uh, this a huge expansion bus on the back where you can add printers and stuff in. This one's very mangled. This is a very broken up machine, unfortunately. Um, this machine uh, here has got its own specialized joystick ports and things. And uh, this machine here, well, this machine here is. <laughs> this is an enigma, this machine. This machine, I suspect, is probably, yeah, I would say is, is probably one of my favorite machines I own now. It's, it's just wonderful. You see, it looks kind of blocky here, but that's because this keyboard is actually separate. So if you have games that only use joysticks, then you can take the keyboard off and unplug it entirely. It's, it's got a little plug in the front you can just pull out. So you can just use this effectively as a console. And you can have the keyboard separately, or it's got these two little holes here which line up with the feet on the keyboard. And so it will just kind of lock in place there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderful machine, and that's a completely, again, different style of doing things. It's also, this is kind of odd, but I, I love it. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, this here is a graphic equalizer, so as you're playing the game, the sound is kind of referenced with LEDs going up and down the screen. Wonderful. <laughs> You'll also see that quite a lot of these machines had two... Oh, well, I'll get that in place in a minute. Two, a couple of these machines had, uh, had two cartridge slots and we just see that that's the second cartridge slot here it's got two this one only got one uh, that is because you can have memory expansion and also game cartridges and so you've got two ports so you can have both there are also extenders available so you can add even more cartridges this one I believe you could have um, memory upgrades in this expansion bus at the back uh, I'm not going to show it because the machine is in a state it doesn't work I need to fix this machine uh, it's in a very poor state indeed uh, and so it's only got one cartridge slot because you just use games in there um, but yeah they're such incredibly versatile machines and um, just genuinely a, a shame we didn't get the huge variety of machines that Japan got because like I said just one day just go onto Yahoo auctions and look for the MSX machines and you'll just see a just embarrassment of options <laughs> <laughs> and some of them are just some of the most gorgeous machines ever. I mean, look at this. This is beautiful. This red thing. It's got, I haven't got them out, but it's got little um, matching puck joysticks, which look like they're going to be really hard to use, by the way. I haven't tried to use them, but they're quite small. Uh, and yeah, and this one, obviously, with, with all this keyboard and everything like that, it's just astonishing machines. This one's slightly more on the duller side. It's coming to the UK after all, but even so, it still looks kind of nice. Like coloured buttons. We like that. I'm sure Amstrad taught us to love these different colour buttons, uh, and this has uh, definitely got them. So yeah, it, it's, a, it's a genuine shame that we didn't get those options and this machine didn't take off over here, because uh, I think it would have been a hugely su successful machine, which you'll see in a minute when I show you some actual Japanese games and how good they were compared to, and when you compare them to like the Spectrum Alternative and the version that came out in the UK, which invariably was a poor port of the Spectrum version. <laughs> I might do comparisons, I don't know, I think it's, I'm not, yeah, I'm not trying to compete machines in general, I'm just showing you how good a machine could be. We're absolutely going to play on this machine because I love this machine to bits, I did a stream recently using it, I just love it, it's, it's a great machine. <laughs> this is a great cartridge by the way, although a pain to set up, it does a lot of stuff and it's very, very good. Anyway, let's go and play some games.
Thank <laughs> you. 